You into Basin special events coverage on VTV6 and Strata Web View is made possible by Century 21 Arca Real Estate Professionals. Brian Gorham State Farm Insurance. You into Basin Healthcare and Wind River Wireless. Well, that was fun. My blood's moving. I thought how, how you guys are doing. Some of you are brave and came up there. Now post it and tell your friends to get over here. Your MC for this evening. Oh, first of all, I should thank Jeff Matthews in the booth running Tech Force tonight. Thank the administration of Roosevelt Junior High School, the, the district school, the school district for Duchesne County, which had the vision to put this hall in our county so we would have a facility like this to perform in. Not just us. Beauty and the Beast here will be. We'll start here this Friday. Uh, so the hall is being used by the community at large. Uh, your MC for this evening will be in the Shuinabee Basin 2013, Ann Wilkins, and I will turn the time to her. All right, okay. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, veterans, active military personnel, military family, and distinguished guests. We are gathered this evening to honor and recognize those members of our community that have served and continue to serve in defending the liberties and freedoms that we enjoy as Americans. We would like to thank the Duchesne County School Board, faculty and administration of Roosevelt Junior High, Mr. Dean Wilson, principal, and Mr. Jeff Matthews, technical director, for their assistance in making this evening a success in celebrating this American tradition. And a special thanks for Strata Networks and VTV for making this program available on cable and online. This evening, the symphony will be under the direction of Steve Perot and Jared Nicholson.
To begin this evening's program, would you all please rise as the members of the Boy Scout Local Eagle Scouts um, present the colors of the United States of America. Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and the performance of the National Anthem by Gloria Deus under the direction of Emily Graham. Color Guard Attention. Color Guard Forward March. Salute. Post the colors of the United States of America. Post the colors of the state of Utah. Please follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Color guard dismissed. Now we will have our invocation. The invocation this evening will be offered by Pastor D. Cairoli. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege and the honor and the blessing to be here. We ask, Lord, today that you would help us. Help us to bring honor and appreciation to our veterans and to their families, but also to bring glory to your name. And Father, I ask right now that you help us, Lord, to, uh, to have peace in our hearts. And I know your word says for us not to be self 
proud and proud of ourselves, but we can be proud of our country and proud of these ladies and gentlemen that have served for you. And today I ask, Lord, that you'd wash over us with your, with your strength and your power by helping us understand that so many here have given up so much, left families, postponed careers, put, put education on hold, whatever, to serve their country. And no greater love has any man than he that lays, down, lays, down, <laughs> lays his life down for his brother. And, and, and I know that some of these have done that, made the ultimate sacrifice, and those have survived and come back. Lord, today that you wash over our hearts today, and let us appreciate them and bring honor. We ask this in the matchless, timeless name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now it is my privilege to introduce our first speaker. Um, please welcome Roosevelt City Mayor, the Honorable Von Ryan. Good evening. How about this pop symphony? Are they great or what? And also the, the choir. I love hearing the national anthem sung the way it was written. That was great. <clears throat> Senator Van Tassel, Commissioner Petrus, ladies and gentlemen, and especially veterans, it's an honor to be with you tonight. As most of you know, 2013 has been the centennial celebration year for Roosevelt City. It's been a hundred years since the state of Utah recognized our city as an incorporated city. Therefore, it is an honor to join with you tonight to celebrate 100 years of heroes. Others could do a better job, I'm sure, in speaking, but I'm honored because I do love this country and because I appreciate very much the men and women who have served and are serving in our armed forces to protect and preserve the freedoms and liberty we hold so dear. Thank you to those veterans. In fact, if I could, could we get all the veterans, those who are serving or have served, to stand? And you can join with us, but everybody, let's give them all a hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. We live in an interesting time in the history of the United States. Many of us are concerned about the direction some things are going. So on the one hand, let's talk about some of the things that we might be concerned about. I've listed some that I thought of, a short list. You may want to add to it. But there are some things that we need to be concerned about. The first one I listed is the national debt. We now are over $17 trillion in debt as a country. That's an unimaginable amount. I have in my pocket here a paper dollar. Uh, it doesn't buy much these days, but if I had a thousand of them, that would be pretty important to most of us. And if I had a thousand of those thousands, I would have what was a dream for many of us when we were young children and is still a dream for many of us, that would be to be a millionaire. And if we had a thousand of those millions, we would have a billion dollars. And if we had a thousand of those billions, we would have one trillion. And if we had over 17 of those trillions, then we would have enough money to cover our national debt. So it is a huge concern. And possibly even more concerning than that tremendous amount is the fact that it's still growing. It's growing even as we speak. 
And I know many of you are like me. You're concerned about not only yourself, but the legacy that you're leaving for your children and grandchildren. The second one I listed was the rampant use of illegal drugs. We all know that they destroy lives of those who use them. They break up families, which are the core of our society. I would venture to guess that everyone in this auditorium tonight, myself definitely included, has had someone in our immediate family or close friend whose life has been negatively affected by the use of illegal drugs. They raise the crime rate because people use uh, turn to crime to get the money to feed the habit that they have and it just destroys the fiber of our society and so that's a big concern. Some of you are as old as me and remember when I was in school, in high school, the wild guys are the ones who would drink alcohol on the weekend and we'd heard about heroin that was in the subways of New York and places like that but we never dreamed that it was anything that we would ever be confronted with. And now we have to worry, is the pilot of the plane that I'm getting on, has he used them in the last 24 hours? Is the doctor, I know none of our doctors, I saw Dr. Graham here earlier, and I know that none of our doctors are in this category, but really you have to think about, is the doctor that's operating on me uh, completely in tune with what he knows and what he has been, he has been taught so that he can do the best job as possible. The third one I mentioned to me is the entitlement programs. In my opinion, they're out of control. The numbers show an ever increasing percentage of the population who are on one or more of the entitlement programs that the government provides. Recently, just two or three months ago, we had a meeting with Lieutenant Governor Bell and he indicated that this is one of the things that they are looking at on a state level and are concerned about is the vast number of people who are getting on entitlement programs and, and letting the government uh, help take care of them. Well, someone has to pay, as we all know, for these programs. So we can increase taxes or again we can increase the national debt. But somehow it has to be paid. A statement I heard once, it says, as we become dependent on government, we lose our freedoms, self-respect, and independence. So that's something for us to all be concerned about. And the last one I mentioned in the negative, on the negative hand here, is mistrust of our elected officials. If you're like me, the last few national elections, I would listen to the debates and one would say this is the way it is and the other one would say this is the way it is and their figures didn't jive at all and I would think somebody has to be lying or else maybe both are, I don't know. But I think it's, uh, it's developed a, a situation of mistrust in our elected officials. Now I don't want to get too political, I've said enough probably uh, with the doom and gloom and so let's talk about this other hand for a minute. We live in the greatest country on earth. That's a fact. We have freedoms others can only dream about. We can do whatever we want, go wherever we want. We can choose our vocation and our level of education. We live in a country with great natural resources and the beauty of nature that we can go and enjoy. We live in a country with great opportunities to expand our education if we so desire. We have a standard of living that's an example to the whole world. We can worship God in our own way and feel safe in doing so. So we have concerns on the one hand, but we have great blessings on the other. What can you and I do to preserve those blessings and address those concerns? I realize I'm speaking to the choir, so to speak. The people who are here tonight are people who already love this country and have those concerns and recognize those blessings and are willing to serve and put their life on the line to preserve those liberties and freedoms. But some of the things we can do, 
Express thanks to veterans wherever you see them. Let them know how much you appreciate their service. Number two I'd put down is respect and honor the flag. It thrilled my heart to feel all of us standing with our hand over our heart as the colors were presented tonight and we recited the Pledge of Allegiance together. Third one is to sing the national anthem. Now we had it performed beautifully for us tonight, but when the opportunity arises, don't be ashamed to sing the national anthem, even if you don't think you're a good singer. Be proud to be an American. It hurts me when I look around when I'm singing the national anthem and I see somebody talking to somebody else and they both got baseball caps on. Uh, make, let's make them feel out of place and that we are proud to be who we are. Next is to vote. Voting is a privilege and a duty. We recently, in fact, just a week ago, we had a local election and we had 939 out of approximately 2,600 eligible voters who took the opportunity to vote. And this was actually quite a bit better than regular times because we did a, uh, mailed out the ballots. And when we do that, we increase our participation dramatically. So we got about 36% of you and I who responded. Uh, and it was an off year, so that was really a pretty good percentage. But still, even then, approximately a third of us are making the decisions of who's going to be elected and what propositions or bonds will pass, and two-thirds of us are, are sitting idly by, hoping for the best. So your vote counts. It, it is a duty to, to vote. So be a good citizen and do that. And the last one is to be a good, honest citizen and an example to others and teach your children to do the same. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but we are very blessed. Let's do our part in preserving our freedoms that these great veterans here tonight have fought so hard to keep for us. God bless you in doing so. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. In recognition of each branch of service, the Pop Symphony will now perform a medley of hymns of the branches of the United States Armed Forces. The title of the work, To Reap the Blessings of Freedom, is taken from Thomas Paine's The American Crisis, written by him on September 12, 1777, the day after the bloodiest conflict of the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Brandywine. Paine's text reads in part, those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. The event of yesterday, September 11, 1777, was one of those kinds of alarms which is sufficient to rouse us to duty without being of consequence enough to depress our fortitude. It is not a field of a few acres or a ground, but a cause that we are defending. And whether we defeat the enemy in one battle or by degrees, the consequences are the same. It would be 224 years until the September 11th morning would find us hallowing another few acres in New York City. It is the American spirit of those in the armed services that answer the call to defend our lasting principles of freedom and a democratic way of life. The music opens with the hymn of the Navy and Coast Guard, Eternal Father Strong to Save, also known as Eternal Father Lord of Hosts. Following this is the Air Force hymn, Lord Guard and Guide the Men Who Fly. Then the music transitions to the Marine Hymn from the Halls of Montezuma and closes with the Army's God of Our Fathers. We would ask that veterans and service members of each military branch stand and be recognized during their respective hymn of the branch service of their servicemen.
the Air Force. Our Marine Corps. The Army. Our second speaker this evening will be the Duchesne County Commissioner. Please welcome the Honorable Kent Petrus. It's both an honor and extremely humbling to be here this evening and to take part in this event and to be charged with the, the challenge of trying to say something that might be uplifting to all of us and to, to carry us forward on this sacred occasion. It's been about 42 years and six months since I was discharged from the Army. And, you know, I've always hesitated to say that because I don't want anybody doing the math and figuring out how old I am because I'm trying to to uh, maintain this younger image, but I know most of you are out there thinking you're fooling yourself, sir, but, uh, but anyway, uh, the point I wanted to make with that announcement was that I believe in the last probably about 15 years, I have stood more at such occasions as rodeos, concerts, special events of this nature than I had in, in the whole prior 30 years or whatever. And it's, it's just kind of a, of course, I was, I was part of, of uh, one of the, the uh, black eyes, you might say, or one of the more controversial wars in, in serving in Vietnam that we have experienced. But I say that based on the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm not here tonight as a, trying to rally a lot of support or recognition for myself or even my fellow veterans. I believe, I'd probably speak for most all veterans, when I would suggest that I think what we would prefer when it comes to recognition is just what Mayor Ryan talked about, is that reverence and that respect and that tear in your eye, if you will, every time we hear the national anthem or every time we say the Pledge of Allegiance or when we're at these special solemn occasions and we recognize that the veteran's duty wasn't to go out there and create 
a bunch of heroes or, or to create a reputation for ourselves, the veteran's duty was to protect a way of life. And to express that, I'd like to tell you a little story. And it, uh, I wasn't involved in this, but you all probably remember the story of the invasion of Grenada. This happened in 1983. Grenada had won its independence from Great Britain in about 1974 and had gone through a, an experience of governing themselves and, and setting up their own government. But in about 1979, a revolution started within that country and it was backed by communism and they uh, took about a four-year war and when all was over in 1983, they had not only captured, but they had murdered the prime minister of the country, had taken over the colleges, and had, uh, had gained control of, of that country. Well, then uh, the United States, I, I uh, haven't, or I've, I've read the history, but I'm not going to go into all the detail that took place in preparing for this. But as you remember, Ronald Reagan was the president at the time, and the operation named Urgent Fury was developed. And on, at 4 a.m. on October the 25th, an invasion took place into Grenada trying to, uh, to uh, save, for lack of a better word, I guess, that country and their way of life. And they, uh, after just four days, had pretty well gained control, but it took about a couple of weeks for them to completely overthrow the uh, communist force. But I have some quotations here that I'm going to be referring to, come from an individual by the name of Keith, Colonel Keith Nightingale, a return, retired army officer, was a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that helped organize that invasion, and also was a, an assault force commander of one of the divisions when they went on, on the beach. But to quote him, he says, speeches from the locals invariably went something like this. And this took place after they had uh, had their, their uh, success. But said, we don't know much about this thing you call Thanksgiving. And we don't understand the food. But we do know that it is important to you and want you to know that our Thanksgiving is the day you came. Thank you. Today in Grenada, Grenada, October the 25th, remains a national holiday for Thanksgiving. Now the colonel goes on to talk about some of the experiences he had with the uh, young men that served in his unit. And he talked about one young man that was accidentally killed when a weapon discharged. And as he wrote the parents of this young man, a letter of condolence they soon wrote back to him and the parents responded saying it was a privilege to have him as their son and a greater privilege to pay back the nation that gave them so much while they suffered a tragic loss it was for a great cause and they would always remember that he was part of something larger than himself Another young man, an E-4 in his unit, he saw carrying a letter one day and a newspaper in one hand and a letter in the other. The letter was from his mother. And when he talked to the young man and asked him where he was going or what was going on, he mentioned that in the letter his mother had wrote and thanked her son for what he was doing, saying that we all owe a debt to the lady in the harbor and that she was so proud that he had paid that debt. Of course, she was referencing the Statue of Liberty. Now, that is, in my estimation, the kind of reverence, the kind of respect that we should have for a great country, the kind of honor that we should tribute to those who have served, but yet to the purpose that they served. And I think that's what's important, that we remember the purpose but I want to tell you the rest of the story to those two examples. And it, it shames me a little bit to think that, as I ask myself, would I have this same kind of response in my heart that these parents had for their sons who had served in this 
campaign. But the first child, the one killed accidentally, was the son of a doctor and a nurse who had immigrated to the United States from India. What an honor they felt and as proud as they was for their son who had actually given his life and they held no remorse that he had given his life for the current country and the purpose. The second young man was from New York by way of Puerto Rico and he told me about a mother he, who had come to America with two babies and worked hard to support them. In both of these cases, immigrants into this great land of America. One other mention of sacrifice that I came across was, uh, and, and there's, there's many of these types of, sto types of stories referencing the, the most recent conflicts in Iraq and Iran and, and those areas, uh, Desert Storm, all of those uh, more recent conflicts, but uh, this is a, a account told by a 32-year-old young mother by the name of Lee Karcher, and it says, she talks about her husband Mark, who came home from his third deployment with TBI, PTSD, if I could remember and wasn't so nervous, I'd tell you what those acronyms stand for, but it's a... Uh, nervous disorder, but it says, and knee and back and shoulder injuries. He suffers from migraine headaches, a hernia, acid reflux, sleeplessness, depression. He has not been able to find a job since he was honorably discharged from the Army and returned to Southern Oregon in September 2010. I sent him <clears throat> to war a whole, healthy, strong man and they returned a broken shell of a man to me. <clears throat> Says Mrs. Kircher, who cares for her husband and six children, ages six to 13. It can be very lonely, it can be a very lonely road, she stated. It's like having another child, a disabled child uh, at that. So then, I'd like to just, in closing, go back to the opening story I mentioned, or the opening comments, and reiterate the first part of that. And this is the statement again from speeches from Granada. Uh, Grenada. It says, we don't know much about this thing you call Thanksgiving, and we don't understand the food, but we do know that it is important to you and want you to know that our Thanksgiving is the day you came. Today, Grenada is a reasonably prosperous, peaceful, and progressive. Any American, especially a soldier, is, is warmly greeted and treated to whatever is available, especially on the 25th of October, when thanks is given at the island, uh, island nation we freed from communism and dictatorship. I always think and, and reference, you know, if I'd have been a braver man than I am, I'd have asked my wife to come up and join me tonight. But I have a happy home and, and thought better of that. So, But you know, I, I would have liked to have had her come up and talk a little bit because kind of one of my campaigns has been in the last few years is looking more towards the families of that sacrifice so much of their loved ones and parting with husbands, fathers, sons, to go and, and to defend this great land in the different conflicts and the places they've sent to go. So often we see of the type of tragedies that I referred to here in this young father with six children and not being able to take care of them. <clears throat> that is a lifelong commitment to that entire family. Can you imagine what it must be for those children not to have the father that can go out and play baseball with them or teach them how to hunt or fish or, or whatever activities. To, uh, it's just one of those sacrifices that that entire family will give. When I left home 42, well it would be 40 years ago I guess, and six months, to go into the armed services, I was married at the time 
and I always thought back and I always uh, referenced the fact that uh, I knew what I was doing. I was okay. I wasn't worried about me. I knew what was taking place. But my parents, my wife, my siblings, and all of those that were left behind lived day to day wondering what was going to happen, what kind of news they would be hearing. And how often, you know, and I, I use myself as an example, but I, I really want to reflect on the, on the entire military service, and, and there are so many. My wife's family had two of her uncles that were killed in, in World War II, and what a tragedy that was to that family to have to lose two sons in the very same conflict. So, folks, I guess my plea tonight on behalf of all my fellow vet veterans is let's not just make this a celebration that takes place in July, on Memorial Day, or on Veterans Day, that we honor and we remember the principles, the way of life, and the standards that have been set forth and have been established by so many who have given so much. Thank you, and God bless America. Veterans Day began as a special holiday honoring military veterans according to U.S. Code, a day to be dedicated to the cause of world peace. The first Veterans Day was known as our Mrs. Day and was declared by President Woodrow Wilson on November 11, 1919, in honor of the official ending of hostilities during World War I, which occurred at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. President Wilson said, to us in America, the reflections of our Mrs. Day will be filled with solemn pride in the heroism of those who died in the country's service and with gratitude for the victory, both because of the thing from which it has freed us and because of the opportunity it has given America to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the councils of the nations." End quote. Many soldiers during the history of our nation have fallen in defense of our ideals and have returned home shrouded in the colors of our country. Others today leave homes, loved ones, and families behind to serve their country and come back to open arms, greeting them on their return. There are those who do not return, though. In the stage play and movie Les Miserables, Jean Valjean laments and prays for the safe return of Marius from battle. Let us reflect for a moment on those families who are separated by war and commitment to national service. Imagine the anguish felt by those left behind worrying about the safety of their loved ones. The pain of separation is beautifully expressed by Jean Valjean in this stage play, Les Miserables, as he prays for a safe return for Marius from battle. Brett Larson, accompanied by the Roosevelt Pops, under the direction of Gerald Nicholson, will now perform Valjean's prayer of safety for Marius, as it is set to music in Bring Him Home. Following his performance, there will be the final roll call, directed by Lieutenant John Golepsy. Oh! 
like the sun I might have known If God had granted me a son The summer's done One by one How soon they fly On and on And I am old And will be gone Derek Lemon. Here, sir. Here. Brian Perkins. Here, sir. Here. Tylene Puro. Here, sir. Here. Byron Kanita. Here, sir. Here. Gardell Powell. Here, sir. Here. David Perkins. Raymond Cook. Here, sir, here. Patricia Cook. Here, sir, here. Dennis Larson. Here, sir, here. John Lemon. Here, sir, here. Boyd Lemon. Kent Petros. Here, sir. Here. Dale Thomas. Burr Eldridge. Here, sir. Here. Carl Potter. Here, sir. Here. Victor Mitchell. Here, sir. Here. Steve Secura. Here, sir. Here. Jim Duke. 
Jim Duke. He's he. Jim Duke. John Urisk. John Urisk. John Urisk. Charles Thompson. Charles Thompson. Charles Thompson. Richard Tatman. Richard Tatman. Richard Tatman. Farrell Markham. Farrell Markham. Farrell Markham. Herman Leffler. Herman Leffler. Herman Leffler. Jimmy Wolf. Jimmy Wolf. Jimmy Wolf. Joe Claiborne. Joe Claiborne. Joe Claiborne. Blaine Young. Blaine Young. Blaine Young. Corey Ostrill. Corey Ostrill. Corey Ostrill. Harvey Brumfield. Harvey Brumfield. Harvey Brumfield. Charles Bolton. Charles Bolton. Charles Bolton.
And now our concluding speaker this evening is our distinguished guest, Utah State Senator Kevin Van Tassel. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Kevin Van Tassel. Veterans and soldiers, thank you for your service and for being here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've been well paid by those who have performed for the talks that we've had given to us. I think there's a great deal of information that's been given to us and we've been given the opportunity to ponder and to think about the things that our soldiers and our veterans in this great country has done. I told Commissioner Petrus that I hated to follow him and uh, it, it ends up being true again. But uh, I, it's also tough to follow as we read those names who are our friends, our family, the ones that we've grown up with who, has now, who have left us and have gone on. And I think about that as we celebrate Roosevelt's 100th year this year as they became a city. When I was young and growing up, I knew a man by the name of Ralph Smith. He worked for my father. We spent a lot of time together riding for cattle and haying and doing those things that we did on the ranch. If he was alive today, he'd be 127 years old. He was also a veteran of World War I. And there's none of those left anymore. The last one died just a year or so ago. And so the World War I veterans are gone. I remember one story that Ralph told me uh, as he was on the ship headed for Europe. He was seasick and was out feeding the fish and the officer came by and he says, you got a weak stomach, huh, soldier? And he said, oh, he said, I don't think so. He says, I can throw as far as the neck guy just down below me. So <clears throat> I guess, you know, there's a little humor in everything. But we get into World War II and, and many of these that we honored tonight as they have left us, many of them fought in that great battle where we really were defending the freedoms of the entire world. And I, I, I don't think that we know enough of that story or that as young people, my children and grandchildren, have probably haven't had that opportunity but I'd like to share with you a, couple, a little story, a, 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 a little bit of two U.N.A. Basin soldiers that served during World War II. One was Mark Overhansley. Some of you might know Mark. He was in a bomber and was shot down and spent four years in a POW camp. As I got to know him as a neighbor and worked with him, didn't say much about it other than it was a tough time. Another veteran that some of you probably know, and if you didn't, it was, it's too bad that you didn't, and that's Alma Glenn Pratt. He participated in the Patan Death March, and he said very little about it. But when he did, it was, that was really tough. And we've learned from history that both of these men, though we don't know their personal experiences, suffered great, greatly as they were, were taken hostage and, and was forced labor and all of those things that uh, we will never know. But I think if I could ask the veterans, it's important that we know. We need to know some of the things that you did. We cannot afford forward to let that die and not have reference to it because once you leave we don't have the World War I stories anymore and the World War II stories there are fewer and fewer of you that have the opportunity to share that with us and I'd encourage you to do that with your family and write a written history if it's difficult for you please write it seal it in an envelope and give it to your family for us, they will know of the sacrifice you have made. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity of going over to Estonia to look at some things and to get to know the country a little bit. I want to share with you a couple of events that I 
as I look back, has been one of the greatest things of my life. They took us to the highest point in Estonia, which is a guard kind of like, if you looked at the old fire guards, guards houses up on the U.S. forest, it was a tower similar to that. And at the top of that, it was a hole 202 feet above sea level. So there's not a lot of mountains. And they took us up there and they, we could see the, the countryside. And I learned something there and I want to pass that on. So maybe you all know it already, but maybe you don't. The longest battle of World War II was fought in Estonia. It began in March, 1944. It ended in September. 1944. Now some of you in this room might know what you were doing on June of 1944. That was the day that we landed on D-Day. June 4th if I remember right, or 6th, June 6th. D-Day landed. And as I talked with the Estonian people, they said, you need to know that our battle here allowed you to succeed in France. And I says, why do you say that? And he says, because we kept six divisions of Hitler's best crews fighting here for that period of time. He said, if we hadn't have been here fighting, we would have had them in France, and you probably would have failed. And so they continued on, and of course the Estonian government uh, was taken over by the Soviet Union. But then a president came along by the name of Ronald Reagan. The Estonian people loved Ronald Reagan because in the late 1980s they became a free and independent country. And they looked to the United States and thank us, just as Grenada did, for their freedoms and the joys that they have. And they are struggling. During World War II, Estonia had 400,000 men constricted to the Russian army. The German army took 350,000 men and put them in the German army. So it was like a civil war, except they were playing for two different sides. In their country, they have a national monument. It's a big question mark because they started out at the beginning of the war with over three million people. They ended the war with a million and a half. A supreme sacrifice. And the question mark is because most of them don't know what happened to their brothers, their fathers. But it was a time of great sacrifice. But they are very proud in the fact that they had the opportunity of setting in motion something that was going to become part of their life down the road 40 years later. And so in the fourth verse of the Star Spangled Banner, it says, then conquer we must when our cause it is just. Our military and our soldiers are the one thing in this world that puts forth the ability of freedom, the ability to win, and to make it possible for other nations, similar to Grenada, similar to Estonia, to expense freedom. I don't know how we put a price on that. We know many of our families put huge prices. They lose fathers, they lose brothers, they lose sisters, maybe even mothers in our efforts today. But I think we want to remember those as we go through, that this is a great opportunity we serve. I am positive today that we have the Navy steaming towards the Philippines with relief and things for that country. It's what we do. It is, we are one of the few nations that does that. And I think we, we have a great heritage and, and proud opportunity to do that. Governor, Lieutenant Governor Bell, before he retired, started asking the, and if I can find it, maybe. And I, I don't have it memorized yet, but he talked about 
having each of the students in the school memorize the Gettysburg Address. And as we remember, Gettysburg was a huge battle in the early part of the Civil War. And thousands of men died on the battlefield and many were wounded. And in his speech, he says, we cannot consecrate or hallow this piece of ground because those living and dead have already done that. And so we are here tonight. We can't hallow or make it any more supreme for our veterans than what has already been done. But I hope and pray and ask that we remember them, that there is a reason that we have a military in the United States. Our veterans are our backbone. They help us, and we support them, and I want to support them. We have a lot of them coming back that are having a hard time finding jobs, and we want to help them find jobs. We want to get them back in working in society, and those are things that we can all do as we look to hire people, as we look to make changes. We need to look at our veterans and get them back. Two years later at President Lincoln's funeral, sen the senator from New York that was talking says, it was the speech that set Lincoln up. It was the speech without it that we would not understand the sacrifice that's been made. And I think that's our great opportunity to be mindful that we cannot or change or do anything that has not already been done, but we can honor you. And we can set our course forward to make sure that we continue to take care of our veterans. I love this country. I love the people of the Uinta Basin. This is a great place to live. It's a great family. And we get smaller as some of us move on, but we also have the opportunity of seeing our younger people step up and fulfill those duties. May we do that and be fulfilled the purposes of God that he has given us to fulfill. And I thank you for your, this time and the opportunity. I am, I am humbled by it and ask God to continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you. America has not stood alone in fighting the enemies of freedom. Britain has long been an ally of the United States. Today in England, British people simultaneously celebrated Remembrance Day to honor their military veterans. In the movie The King's Speech, the future King George VI struggles with a speech impediment which causes excessive stammering. As he works with a therapist to help his ability to speak, he ascends to the throne at the death of his father, King George V. Early in his reign, the dark cloud of Nazism begins to spread across Europe and threatens England. In September of 1939, England declares war on Germany. King George must deliver his first wartime speech via radio. Part of his speech rings as true today as it did then at the dawn of World War II. Roger Hullingo will now portray George VI as he delivers this speech. The Roosevelt Pops will then perform the second movement from Beethoven's symphony as it is used in the film of the King's speech. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this evening and honoring those common citizens who do the uncommon in defending our rights, our freedoms, and our liberties. God bless our veterans, our active troops, the families of those who serve, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. In this grave hour, perhaps the most fateful in our history, I send to every household of my peoples, both at home and overseas, this message, spoken with the same depth of feeling for each one of you as if I were able to cross your threshold and speak to you myself. 
For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. Over and over again, we have tried to find a peaceful way out of the differences between ourselves and those who are now our enemies. But it has been in vain. We have been forced into a conflict, for we are called with our allies to meet the challenge of a principle which, if it were to prevail, we would, would be fatal to any civilized order in the world. Such a principle, stripped of all disguise, is surely the mere primitive doctrine that might is right. For the sake of all that we ourselves hold dear and of the world's order and peace, it is unthinkable that we should refuse to meet the challenge. It is to this high purpose that I now call my people at home and my peoples across the seas who will make our cause their own. I ask them to stand calm and firm and united in this time of trial. The task will be hard. There may be dark days ahead and war can no longer be confined to the battlefield. But we can only do the right as we see the right and reverently commit our cause to God. If one and all we keep resolutely faithful to it, ready for whatever service or sacrifice it may demand, then, with God's help, we shall prevail.
Enjoy the, uh, the, evening, the rest of the evening, and thank, thank you for coming to Sudor Veterans. Have a great night.
You into Basin special events coverage on VTV6 and Strata Web View is made possible by Century 21 Parker Real Estate Professionals, Brian Gorham State Farm Insurance, You into Basin Healthcare, and Wind River Wireless.